Good afternoon guys and uh, welcome to this afternoon debrief. Uh, this is a profile strategy debrief using the price ladder. So what we're going to do is we're going to get stuck straight into it. Uh, obviously sorry for the delay. Uh, we have had obviously quite a bit of commentary coming out of ECB's Weidman. Uh, markets are sensitive to the central bank at the moment, hence the slight delay. So straight into it, obviously, uh, let's just go through some of the uh, market moving fundamentals this afternoon. Uh, first and foremost, obviously we had uh, the um, obviously had the, uh, the the minutes come out of the ECB now. Some of the key takeaways from that minutes, obviously, uh, we did learn uh, some new information, and some of that uh, I've kind of summarised for you. So let's just go through it line by line. Uh, first and foremost, I think this was quite an interesting line here, where the ECB says, uh, you know, the use of other instruments within mandate could not be excluded. Now, I think that's becoming a, a more important line uh, because of the, you know, the the, the real uh, argument that's going on about the lack of or, or not enough supply of bonds uh, on the board. So straight away, uh, you know, one of the first things you want to pay attention to uh, in the next ECB meeting uh, is this idea of composition. In other words. What uh, you know? How do they purchase ultimately that 60 billion? Now, uh, in the past, obviously, predominantly uh, the purchases are made up of uh, you know sovereign bonds. Um, so the you know in the past, the big issue has been obviously uh, aside from sovereign bonds, there isn't a great deal of other assets that the ECB can ultimately buy. So. Just pay attention over the next couple of days and weeks and commentary uh, if we do hear anything about this idea of composition, you know, or if sources come out and talk about a shift in composition. Now, note obviously a change in composition would likely be a result of, uh, you know, this diminishing supply of uh, available bonds to the ECB. So, you know, the minute we get this idea or this talk of composition, uh, that's going to give some incredibly good opportunities, particularly in the short side, uh, you know, of the German bonds, simply because, you know, that is kind of where the supply, um, you know, constraint is, is uh, obviously being felt the most. So just be aware of, you know, what that composition means. Obviously, you know, the devil is in the detail. So what, you know, they, they decide they want to change to uh, will ultimately dictate where the flows go. Uh, but in essence, you know, a shift in the composition will be because of, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, the supplier is starting to run out. So that will give, obviously, a very specific opportunity in the uh, bonds. And then second, obviously, yeah, the ECB came out and they said it kind of in two two lines. Yeah, they said, you know, they they want to show caution in communication uh, so that they don't send a signal to the market, you know, and, and effectively tighten conditions. So, you know, twice, you know, we we then see in this in the second line where they say, you know, incremental changes could be misperceived as fundamental policy change. So, what they're trying to send a signal to the market is that, you know, just because they're changing the statement, just because you know they're acknowledging, you know, growth and maybe maybe acknowledging, you know, downside risks of. Uh, gone now uh, it doesn't imply a shift in policy okay and that's crucial to understand you know the the central bank wants to avoid a taper tantrum type uh, you know impact so just keep an eye on that you know again we've seen the central bank come out they've played down you know the the the, the commentary they made up until that point uh, when we had the meeting in june uh, so again just something to think about then Obviously, they say the inflation outlook is vulnerable to premature tightening. So this is this concept that Draghi keeps saying that, you know, if they were to, you know, reduce key QE, uh, you know, maybe taper too early or, you know, uh, you know, sort of slow up the bond purchases, you know, that could ultimately really be a, a massive risk, you know, to the inflation outlook. So they really are cautious right now, uh, as we can see in those first uh, three lines. Then obviously, uh, rate setters discussed revisiting the easing bias, uh, you know, but decided prudence remained warranted. Now, this is quite interesting. Obviously, they, they you know they revisited the easing bias. Now, again, it depends what you think uh, they're referring to as this easing bias. Uh, but for me, you know, this, you know, I, I get the feeling they were maybe referencing this all beyond. Um, again, the devil's in the detail. Uh, but again, we're seeing that there is, you know, the spectrum across the board of, you know, some members are talking about, you know, more easing or holding on to the easing at least. And some members are talking, you know, about, you know, it's time to have that discussion about when we do start to ultimately uh, taper. So very interesting minutes. Net and net, uh, you know, if we're going to call this hawkish or dovish, we're going to call it hawkish equals dovish. Okay, there's something in there for the hawks uh, and equally there's something in there for the doves. The net result, as we can see, uh, in terms of market moving, I wouldn't say a great deal. Obviously, we did have quite an aggressive offer in the bunds uh, once that had come out. Uh, however, I would say net net that probably wasn't a result of the minutes. Uh, it's probably more a result of the technical landscape uh, on the day. We can see obviously a massive surge in volume uh, as we also obviously uh, went to the downside. 
Okay, so that was the key sort of market moving fundamentals, what we learned today. Uh, in terms of the data, uh, all that was key was the ADP. As you can see, a little bit of a miss, 158 versus 185. Uh, you know, call it a 27K miss. Now, what I will point out, okay, ADP traditionally, it used to be a very good barometer for NFP. It isn't. That's the simple fact. It isn't anymore. Uh, it isn't a good gauge. Uh, there's no real strong correlation to speak of. Uh, so again, you know, if you do hear that on the news or the newspapers, just bear in mind, you know, you know, don't always believe what you hear. Go look at the facts. Okay, if you get a correlation up between ADP and NFP, you'll see that correlation isn't particularly strong. Okay, in terms of obviously some other uh, you know information, obviously Canadian building permits. Okay, there wasn't much of a move in the CAD, uh, but again, you know, really really nice pickup in uh, building permits, and then obviously the weekly uh, you know initial jobless claims came in mostly expected. Last but not least, obviously the oil inventories. Okay, and again another draw, a nice big draw this time. Uh, obviously there was a little bit of expectation for this draw, but ultimately we got quite a nice little rally up in the oil, a uh, good 40-50 tick move to the upside before backing off. So net net some good data out today. Uh, it's given us some more information whether it was the ECP, uh, whether it was the ADP or the oil. We are really, you know, the data is giving opportunity. It is creating uh, volatility, and uh, you know that's what we want, guys. We use the data, not necessarily to hit the market okay one thing you must understand about data is that a lot of time someone that's looking for liquidity or someone that's looking to 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 offload a position into the market very often they're gonna wait for what they'll call the tail risk okay now that is why sometimes you know you might see for instance you know the market comes out and initially we get the blip up on a really really you know specific number where the market should only go up yet it goes in the opposite direction okay this occurs simply because larger time frame participants use the data, they use the information to ultimately execute uh, their orders once the tail risk is out of the way. Okay, so that's why we use the data. We don't use the data to trade off. We use the data because it can bring potential volatility and opportunity. Okay, so let's get straight into it. Our strategies we're going to talk, we're going to start a little bit about tail reversals. I'm going to talk to you about this, talk to you about the implications of it. We're then going to have a look at the German bunds. All right, then we're going to move on to uh, the uh, low volume area and ledge play. I'm going to show you how it played out, what it all means, uh, and what these concepts are, as well as look at the price ladder with regards to that. So let's get onto the drawing board and have a quick little look so the first thing we spoke about tails this morning okay we spoke about the significance of the two tails in the bun now a tail is nothing more than a very strong auction process where the market deems you know this area to be of a discount and obviously the upside uh, being somewhat a premium okay so that's the first thing to understand when we have tails in the market it's just a very strong auction process now one of the most important things to understand about these tails is that you know it takes a specific amount of initiative. Okay, so if we're going to go there, I and I, as well as I and I. So in other words, it takes a bit of initiative to create these tails. Now, what we mean by initiative is that as the market's coming down and filtering down into this area, it requires not just profit taking from shorts, but it also requires aggressive buying from the buyers, and it's that aggressive buying that creates a net positive position. Okay, so we got a positive position for the buyers, all right, and that's the key to understanding a tail. So the first thing you need to understand is that when we do get these good auction lows, they act as very good swing lows and highs in the market. Second to that, they also act as particularly important points where there are positions that could be unwound. Okay, so that's the key to understanding tails. Now, what we're talking about in this morning's stream was the fact that you know the Bund had a tail on both sides of the market. Okay. More importantly, we said if we take out that tail to the upside, we should then see continuation to the upside as we get a profit-taking move. Equally, to the downside, if we took that out, we'd expect to see initiative in and around those 42s. Uh, and again, a, a lot of participation once we took out that line. I think that's something to really, really point out, guys. I just want to reference the Soki, okay? It's not to say that if we take out uh, a tail low or a tail high for that matter, it's not to say that you're going to get that position unwind, okay? But what you are going to get is you're 100% going to get a really large pickup in participation, okay? And by participation, we mean volume, okay? So I'm going to write it there, volume. Okay, so all that means is that when price when prices now get below this key reference point, 
right? It brings a lot of participants in, whether that's you know short-term long stopping out, whether that's big time frame participants that are buying lower, whether that's aggressive shorts that are getting in on the breakout. It brings in a lot of participants and ultimately a pickup in the volume. Okay, so it's that participation you want to pay attention to because participation by its very nature means the market will go one way or the other. Okay, and it's that one way or the other that presents the golden opportunity. All right, I will show that to you in the charts uh, as we move on, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so that's the tails. Now, the second uh, key thing we're going to talk about today is a ledge and a low volume area. Okay, so remember what we said. A low volume area is just where there's a very uh, little amount of trade facilitated. Okay, whereas a high volume area is where there is a large amount of trade facilitated. Okay, now traditionally trade can be facilitated via only time, which is referenced as TPOs in market profiling, or as volume, which is what most traders nowadays reference. Okay, so volume uh, it shows us, or, or a low volume area shows us where there is a real low amount of volume that is traded uh, in a given time frame. Okay, whereas a high volume area is a high amount of volume. Now, a ledge is nothing more than where the market effectively trades a large, chunky amount of volume ahead of uh, a low volume area. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this so you'll get a little bit of a better understanding of how this uh, ultimately looks. Now, the key to understanding is, is that a low volume area ultimately shows us again this concept of initiative. Okay, sorry guys, I know I'm writing quite quickly here. Okay, so a low volume area shows us initiative. It shows us intention taken by, in this example, by sellers. Okay, sellers got uh, aggressive. They initiated into the market and they managed to take prices aggressively lower. Okay, so by the very nature of initiative being taken, there is again a positive position by the shorts in the market. Okay, so. That's why when we have a ledge protecting this low volume area, it tends to act as a short unwind area. Okay, And that's the crux of the price ladder replay I'm going to show you today. I'm going to show you what that ledge looks like. I'm going to show you the execution of it and ultimately uh, the end product uh, of, of this entire uh, uh, trade opportunity. Okay, let's get on to the charts. So straight away, Let's just get into the uh, German buns. One sec. Okay. Alrighty. All right, just the buns. Let's get into it. So first thing we're going to pay attention to is those tails. Let's talk about those tails and have a look at them. Okay, so as you can see, obviously we had the C print tail towards the upside. Remember I referenced this morning talking about the bad high. Okay, so not only was that a tail, uh, you know, a tail uh, reference where there was potential for shorts to stop out and take profit, but it was equally a bad high in the market. Okay, so there was quite a bit of confluence on the break potential to the upside. Equally to the downside, we had the two tails from obviously Monday and then again yesterday. So we had a double bottom of tail and I came into this hypothesis saying that you know, if we break to the upside, uh, we'll be looking for a break through 12s and then obviously if there's a break to the downside, uh, again an aggressive pickup in the participation on the break of that tail. Okay, so ultimately what we got, we got the break of the tail. Now what I am going to say to you, okay, is this is going to look a little bit picture perfect. I never like to, you know, come across and be Mr. Harry Hindsight, okay, because it's very seldom going to look as pretty as this. But what we can see is that once we took out, you know, that double bottom or that double tail bottom, note the aggression, so note the initiative. Remember, single prints and a low volume area show us initiative. Okay, so what we ultimately got in this instance was initiative via the R print. The market then distributed lower. Okay, so you can see what the impact was of once we took out uh, that double bottom tail. Okay, we got real initiative. Now, remember what I said to you. The trade opportunity is not that the market's going to break out and collapse in a straight line. Okay, the trade opportunity is that we should see a pickup in initiative. Now, let me show you what that looks like. Okay, for this I'm going to get a little bit of a shorter time, time frame up. Now, let's go back up and have a look what it looks like when it takes out the previous day's swing low. Okay, I just want to get a reference on that price. It was 54. Okay, so if I move this blue line up again, if you don't know me well enough by now, I use blue lines as positional stops, okay, where stops are triggered or where stops are potentially going to be triggered. Okay, so what we can see, notice, the market came down, 
it took out the 54s and notice what it did. It dropped straight from 54s all the way down to 43s. Now more important, remember what I said, it's not about the breakout, it's about the participation. What do we see on the volume? Okay, a real surge in the volume, right? And that ultimately is what we're after. We're after that surge and that pickup in activity. Now remember what I said to you, okay? You have to be very vigilant and very switched on when we have the break of these key areas. Because note what, ha note what has happened. We've had the flush and then all of a sudden this market has started to go bit up, bit up, bit up, bit up, okay? Now, what very often happens, uh, you know, particularly on obvious breaks, okay, remember this tail double bottom is quite obvious, it's, it's obvious to every market participant, okay, so because it is so obvious, there is an overly aggressive short in the market, so what seems to have occurred here is that the entire market has gotten short quite aggressively. And the fact that they've gotten short quite aggressively is what has allowed this market to ultimately rotate higher as those short-term shorts, those very aggressive shorts, have slowly, steadily unwound. Note what happens then. Once we take out that 43s, we then ultimately get the really aggressive move to the downside. Okay, now, what I want to point out to you and something that you know I struggled with personally today, okay, is I was on the break for the short. But then what ultimately I did was once we came back up to those 54s, I actually turned and flipped myself long. Why? Because, well, it was effectively a head fake. Okay, that's what we saw, was a head fake in the market. Okay, so we took out the stops to the downside, failed the tail double bottom, saw the auction process reversing, and potentially posted a head fake. So I bought the 54s. Okay, but I put a stop where? I put a stop pretty much on the low. Why? Because we should never have revisited if it is a traditional head fake. Once it took out those 43s, we then got the move to the downside, the desired move to the downside. Now, I will say, and this is, this is the important thing to understand, okay, this down move did coincide with obviously a very important break in the yield level. Okay, and that's why I want you guys clear your head of this being the holy grail strategy. Okay, it's not about the strategy. What I want you to understand is that when there are tails in the market, that will bring in volatility, volume, and participants. And in and around that volume, volume, and participation, you can determine various strategies. Okay, that's the key to tails, and that is why we observe them on the market profile. Okay, let's now move on to the second strategy, and let's talk a little bit about the Euro FX. Now, again, I'm just going to bring this up onto the chart. Now what I want to do is I want to just show this to you if I just remove a little bit of today's session. Okay, that's not going to work. Let's do this. Okay, let's just go into the daily session. So what you can see is obviously the euro pretty much over the course of the last four days or three days, what we've done was we opened the week at the highs. We kind of had a double distribution day on Monday, uh, a very tight distribution day on Tuesday, uh, sorry, Wednesday. And then today we kind of distributed in and around yesterday's value area before coming to test in and around this low volume area. Okay. Now, if I was to just combine these three, uh, or sorry, if I was just to combine uh, the last three days prior to today, you will see what I was talking about. Okay, so over the course of the week, what we've had is two distinct distributions. Now, the market today, we had formed a little bit of a ledge in and around that 18 to 21 area. Okay, now, as we can see, this is a TPO ledge. So you can see there, there's a real ledge that's formed in and in front of that set of singles or that little bit of initiative that was taken earlier on the week to the downside. Okay, so by that very definition, with the ledge in play, we have the potential for the shorts, anyone that was short with that initiative, to potentially take profit or stop out of those shorts. And that's the trade opportunity we were looking for. We were looking for the break of those 21 and a halves, which is where that, uh, that ledge ultimately was. And we were looking for a target to fill in up towards the 48s. Okay, why the 48s? Well, because it was a set of single prints left from Tuesday's trading session. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to physically go through this uh, on the price setup. But what I want to just point out, and so crucial, when the markets leave double distributions like this, like we've got on the weekly, there's a very high probability that the market will then turn and fill in that low volume area and turn it into a high volume area. Okay, so straight away, for me looking, uh, you know, at this, um, you know, this, uh, 
me looking at the uh, the volume profile what I'm looking at straight away as a hypothesis is for the euro to trade out between 114 figure and 114 60 okay that's what I'm kind of looking at for the course of tomorrow for the market to fill out over these two areas on the chart okay now what I want to do is I want to go and get the price letter up and let's go and have a look at uh, where the dis you know the opportunity uh, ultimately existed so let's get that ladder up and we can have a look okay so first and foremost sorry guys just bear with me for a minute just a few comments coming out okay so what you've got is obviously you've got the ladder on the right. Now I'm going to go through three distinct areas or three distinct moments within this, you know, trading of this euro, and I want you guys just to, um, you know, pay attention to the price action. So remember what I said to you first and foremost. Uh, we're looking at the break of the 31 and a half. Sorry, it was 31 and a half. Was the ledge? Uh, we want to pay pay attention to those 31 and a half. See how the price action uh, responded. Now note, okay. For me as a trader, I would tend to preempt this. Why? Because structurally, it makes sense from a risk reward for me to preempt. In other words, I want to buy it into the ledge and be leveraging up on the ledge or just ahead of the ledge. So, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, today in the mental session, when do I want to leverage? Well, I want to leverage at that point in time where I've perfected the timing and I can ultimately take advantage uh, of, uh, you know, the, the, the break or, or the key moment. So, we can see this occurred over the um, over the ADP. So we can see the market came up. Let's just briefly pause that. Okay, so ADP market came out. It was the ADP number. It came out again slightly weaker. Now note, you know, a lot of people say, well, why do we watch the data? You know, you can't trade off the data. But actually, because I had the structural play in mind, because I had this ledge of 31 and a halves in mind, I was far more willing to be aggressively buying through that high. Why? Because it's the number that's allowed my strategy to come in play. Okay, it's the number that's taken price to this 31 and a half and will ultimately allow me to take the market and finish up, uh, you know, up or, or trade the opportunity out. Now remember, we were targeting somewhere around the 44s to 48s. We've now lifted through that 31 and a halves. Let's see what happens. So note the price action. Okay, we can see the market goes off it into the 31 and a halves, 31 and a halves, 31 and a halves. Note the reloading taking place ahead of the 31 and a halves. Again, 31 and a halves, 31 and a halves, 31 and a halves. If you look on the right here, you can see 260 lots trade. So 31s, 31 and a halves, 31 and a halves, blips down to 29s. Okay, so again, what I would always say is for me personally, the fact that it didn't, you know, initially we saw the reloading, we can see it there, 31 and a half, 32, we can see 400 contracts traded, you know, reloading bid, but it then took it out, okay, so that's not what I want to see, if I'm expecting stops around the 31 and a half, I would then expect the, you know, the very, uh, you know, people that need to stop out to be more aggressive and buy out of those stops, okay, the fact that it didn't tells me that, you know, maybe this trade strategy is not quite what I expected, so in this instance, note guys, you know, you can be 100% right about trade ideas, 100% the right strategy, but you need to use the price ladder ultimately to give you that final bit of information, okay, let's see what happened though once it did go back but up, so we came to 29 and a halves, now note this time, 31 and a half, 32s, and it should come back in a sec. Okay, 32s lift. Note the 33s lift, and straight away the 33 and a halves lift. And you're going to see a little bit of stop out price action now. So you can see twos hold, two and a halves hold, threes, fours, five, six, seven. Okay, and that's the stopping out that we wanted to see. That's the really aggressive move up. Now, when you start to see this little bit of stopping out, it's so crucial as a strategy. Okay, one of our most successful traders here. You know, a lot of you, you know, would have, uh, you know, heard of Demetrius or, or seen Demetrius. One of his most successful strategies is that when there is stopping out, he's very, very aggressively buying up the market or, or forcing those people to stop out. So yeah, as a strategy, if you're someone who likes to chase stops, when they begin to stop out, they're not simply going to just stop. Okay, so... So, so important, you know, you want to be buying around these 35s and offs and keep playing and keep putting pressure on these guys stopping out their trades. Okay, so that was the initial lift. We did then rotate up until, you know, somewhere around these 40, 41 and a halves, somewhere there. Now, that's the first part. So the first part is we were looking for the break of the stops above that ledge targeting 40, uh, the 40 area. Now, the second thing I want to show you is what happens when we revisit 
that 31 and a half. Remember we spoke about the key absorption there. Let's now see what happens when we actually do revisit that area. Okay, so let's just move this on a little bit. And okay, so you're going to see in a minute we're going to get that euro back up. Now what I want to bring your attention to is obviously, you know, remember that price level we're talking about uh, being the 31 and a half. So we've come down to it and note straight away 35 large trade and again straight away reload. Note the reload there guys. Okay, so the minute you've seen that, if we just go back a couple of seconds, let's watch that again very briefly. Okay, so the market goes off at 31 trades, goes bid, goes off it again, 9 lots and reloads. Okay, and straight away bid up. Okay, so we saw straight away someone was selling, but equally the buyer was bidding. Okay, so we got some really nice absorption on those 31 and a halves again. So for me as a trader, you know, that's the first key reference point. If that was the point where the stops were triggered, then that is the point I want to pay close attention to on the first retest. Okay, now what then happens is the market ultimately rotates a little bit higher up towards the 36 area. That's the second key piece of price action you wanted to pay attention to. Now the last piece of price action is where we ultimately get the continuation in the euro. So note what we said, and this is so crucial. You know, sometimes when you look at a strategy, I know a lot of you guys say to me, you know, you sometimes get out of trades because it doesn't quite get to your target, or you know, you, you get frightened out of it. Now, when you are frightened out of a trade, okay, don't give up on that trade. Right, markets tend to have what I like to call measured moves. In other words, they have, uh, they should complete a move. Now, looking at this euro, 40 and a halves was not an area that you know shorts should be selling or people would be positioning. Okay, it's merely an area where maybe we saw a little bit of profit taking from the algorithms or from whomever was breaking out towards the upside. Okay, equally we can see 258 contracts traded at the high, suggesting that this was a very poorly auctioned high. Okay, and using that information, this is the key. When you get out of a trade, don't give up on the trade. Okay, because a trade will tend to complete itself. You just need another signal to take on that trade opportunity again. And that is ultimately what we got here. Eventually, we can see the market held on to those 31 and a halves, and slowly but surely, we started to drift higher and higher and higher. And as I currently speak, the euro is trading around the 114.60 area. Okay, that's the three key pro, you know, processes to, this is a breakout strategy, okay? A lot of you know breakout strategies, you, you've read about breakout strategies, you know more or less how they work, but I want you to start thinking in terms of what are the participants doing on that breakout, okay? And, and where do these breakouts occur best? Is it when we're using, for instance, as I've shown you, is it when we have a low volume area and a ledge? Okay, or is it in the example of the German Bunds where we have a tail, a double bottom tail, and we get the breakout? Two breakouts, two different sets of preconditions, but ultimately two very good tradable opportunities. Alrighty. So back into it then. Um, let's just wrap up. Obviously, you've got all the information. Uh, if you want any information about the courses or about particular volume profiling, okay, you'll see um, everything I reference, whether I'm tweeting uh, or whether I'm you know, talking to you guys in the mentored session, I always come back to volume profiles simply because it is my preferred choice of tool. Right? I understand structure with profiles and I also understand the strategies I want to take on using those same profiles. Okay, So if you are interested in profiles and you want to learn you know, sort of 12 very unique unique trade strategies, uh, you know, what the course does cover very well is pretty much this grid, okay, this is a grid of trade strategies you will ultimately learn when doing the profile course. So again, there is also a one hour, you know, sort of section of that course you can take, it is on the website guys, so just go and watch that one hour, okay, see if it is a course for you, see if there's, you know, if it's something that can add value to your trading, okay, if it is, you know, send me an email, send the info docs here an email and, uh, you know, make sure you don't miss out on that course. Alrighty, um, so yeah, that's a wrap for today. Obviously, thank you for joining me. Uh, it's been fun uh, spending time with you all day. You won't hear from me again until Sunday uh, when we have the Periscope. So have a good evening. Make sure you finish those debriefs. Go over those two breakouts. You know, make sure you understand the concepts uh, of both the tail uh, as well as obviously the low volume area and the ledge. Good luck and have a good evening.